Hey everybody, uh, we're going to get started. Um, first, thanks for joining us for our first lunch of the library of the 2022-2023 academic year. My name is Bayard Miller. I uh, head up the programming division here at the American Philosophical Society Library and Museum. My colleague, uh, somewhere on here, uh, Dr. Adriana Link, who is slated to host today's event, uh, is unable to attend and deeply regrets not being here in person with all of you. Uh, nonetheless, I'm excited to welcome you to today's program on electing the president, the debates on the Electoral College at the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in virtual reality. Uh, we're especially grateful to the Jack Miller Center uh, for providing funding for uh, this program. <clears throat> So let me begin by acknowledging that the uh, APS resides in what is now known as Philadelphia, which is Lenape Hoking, uh, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and into the future. Uh, in recognizing this, the society expresses its thanks for the past and ongoing uh, generosity of the Lenape, as well as that of numerous other indigenous communities and individuals throughout this continent <clears throat> who've offered guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. Their generosity makes the work of the Society's Library Museum possible. Uh, so as many of you know, I think, uh, the APS was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Uh, election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to the science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over $1.5 million in research grants per year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe and from right down the street. The lunch at the library uh, provides us with an opportunity once a month to gather for a, uh, a meal and to hear about new research of interest to the APS community. Uh, but before I introduce today's speakers, please let me remind you of a few upcoming events. Uh, next week on Thursday, September 22nd, we've got uh, our assistant head of conservation and book conservator, Renee Wolcott. Uh, She's going to give a talk based on her latest book, now out from APS Press, uh, Preserving Useful Knowledge. Should be a good one. Uh, and on September 29th uh, through the 30th, we'll be hosting our fall conference on living with climate change, which aims to look beyond the science that proves the existence of climate change and to look broadly at how uh, changing climate already has and will continue to affect people in all aspects of their lives. Uh, but now I'm uh, very pleased to welcome our speakers. Uh, so first here on my list, I've got uh, Kevin R. Hardwick. Kevin is the professor of history at James Madison University and also a longtime professor on the faculty of the James Madison Memorial Foundation Summer Institute. He teaches courses in early American, Atlantic, and constitutional history, and has edited three books, including most recently, The American Debate Over Slavery, 1760 to 1865. Uh, but a side note, uh, our librarian and, directory, uh, and director, uh, Patrick Spiro, wanted me to be absolutely sure to express his sincere regrets for not being here to welcome Kevin himself, even though Kevin is up here on the screen, as we see. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, it was pa uh, Professor Hardwick's undergraduate class on colonial America that sparked Patrick's interest in the Paxton Boys Rebellion, which then developed into his dissertation and then resulted in his first book on the politics of the frontier, and eventually uh, uh, Patrick's interest in another related rebellion on his second book. So uh, he sends his sincere thanks to you, Kevin. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Warren R. Hofstra. He's the Stuart Bell Professor of History at Shenandoah University. In addition to teaching in the fields of American and social and cultural history and directing the Community History Project of the university. His long-term research program focuses on the regional history of the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia and as a field of inquiry in a large-scale investigation of American capitalism and material culture. Then we have uh, Muhammad F. Obeid. Uh, he's an associate professor uh, and the director of Augmented Virtual Reality Design program at Shenandoah University, as well as the Shenandoah Center for Immersive Learning. He holds a PhD uh, uh, and a master of science in modeling and simulation engineering uh, from Old Dominion University and a BS in industrial engineering from the German Jordanian University. <clears throat> His research revolves around uh, synthetic environments and medical oriented simulations, encompassing extended reality platforms interactive and predictive simulation, uh, computer-assisted interventions, and multidimensional immersive environments to supporting training and decision-making. Lastly, uh, also up here on the screen somewhere, a, uh, a pioneer of immersive learning, J.J. Rosella. I think I said that right? Yeah, good, all right. Uh, serves as chief, chief immersive officer and executive vice president of Access VR, an immersive technology development and application firm. Most recently, his, uh, his immersive design taxonomy was published by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and adopted by the Air Force University in his training curriculum. 
JJ founded and led the Shenandoah Center uh, for Immersive Learning at Shenandoah University as executive director. Uh, Russell is an expert in applied story with more than 25 years of experience in simulation and training. I'll let them take it from here. I think it's on. Very good. It's, I can't tell you how great an honor uh, and, and privilege it is uh, for us to be here today. Uh, and we're deeply gratitude, <laughs> thankful to the um, American Philosophical Society for the, inf in, uh, the invitation uh, and for this connection uh, between Patrick Sparrow and Kevin Hardwick. Uh, that initiated uh, this contact. Uh, and to everyone uh, here who has been involved in the program, uh, we're sorry we can't meet Adriana Link uh, personally, but uh, she's uh, uh, online. And, um, but uh, thanks to Baird for uh, hosting us, uh, to Nathan uh, for facilitating uh, our, our visit. We're very grateful. Uh, we're also thankful uh, to the Jack Miller Center uh, for providing the funding. Uh, and I will say that we couldn't have accomplished what many of you experienced, uh, the great experiment, uh, without close collaboration uh, with the uh, Independence Hall National Historic Park uh, and the National Constitution Center. So our thanks go uh, to both of these really fine organizations and thanks. And we look forward to, as we develop uh, the great experiment, uh, to further, further collaboration. Uh, we're gonna begin uh, with a, uh, a brief video uh, that provides, well, a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, more, than, more than we could say uh, offhand. Uh, it'll help you understand how the great experiment was constructed. Then I'll come back and make a few comments. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mohamed Obeyard, uh, and then uh, also uh, Kevin Hardwick and JJ Rosella will have an opportunity to participate uh, in the discussion. Just one second, we're having some slight issues with the technology. <laughs>
I'm going to have a, f a few brief comments. Uh, we want to move quickly through the speechifying uh, and so that we can engage all of you in an open discussion. Because for those of you who have already experienced the great experiment, we want your feedback. And we also, also want to entice those of you who are not able to attend the morning session uh, to take advantage of a briefer time uh, in the early afternoon. Let me explain a few things to begin with. The great experiment. Uh, why did we choose this title for our project? It's a working title, uh, but it's beginning to stick. Uh, it's a bit cliched. Uh, yes, it's used for advertising, in this case, insurance. Uh, and if you flip to the next slide, uh, washing machines, space ventures. The term, of course, comes from a letter that George Washington wrote to the great English historian Catherine Macaulay in 1790, saying that uh, oh, the new nation is the last great hope for promoting uh, human happiness. So, of course, it was this historical context uh, that we wanted to embrace uh, in our project, because our focus is on of the Constitution and the convention uh, that created uh, that new government. But we also have an internal oh, uh, it, or, uh, or call, reason for the great experiment, uh, and that is it's our experiment. It's our experiment uh, in putting the Constitutional Convention uh, into virtual reality. Uh, we're testing. Uh, to uh, the effectiveness of it. Uh, we're uh, in many ways pioneering, as my colleague Professor uh, Obeid will say, uh, new, some new technological applications. So it's our experiment, and it's for that reason that we're uh, here today to share this experiment with you, but also to get any uh, feedback and, and response that you can provide. I think the best way I can introduce the scope of the project is to tell you its origin story, which is a little curious. Uh, this goes back about 10 years ago. Uh, I had been on the faculty in history for quite some time uh, at Shenandoah University, but I had the opportunity to meet uh, the new director of our theater program, J.J. Rusella, uh, fittingly over beers at a public event. Uh, we fell uh, to talking. Now, unfortunately, JJ is on injured reserve, so he can't join us in, in person. Uh, but we'll try to maybe rectify that sometime in the future. But uh, I, I think both of us connected uh, in this realm of theater and history and how the stories of peoples can be uh, dramatized on stage. And we walked away from that discussion a little wobbly, but uh, we come forward to a partnership, so let's work together on some uh, projects. Uh, so JJ contacted me um, uh, about a year later saying, I'm, I'm producing and directing To Kill a Mockingbird uh, in our theater. Uh, uh, can you put together an installation in the theater lobby that resonates with the play? Uh, so I developed with my students uh, an exhibit of, of, of events that took place uh, in the 19, in, during World War II that eerily parallel uh, in a local context the storyline of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And that taught us uh, something about working together. At this time, JJ was transitioning uh, from uh, live theater to simulation, and uh, you know that he was the founding director of the Shenandoah Center for uh, Immersive Learning. Uh, and I had a, just an innate fascination uh, with virtual reality uh, as well. Uh, and JJ and I had um, said we'd try other projects to work together. Uh, the first one was a student, once, once again, a student-led project uh, in, in virtual reality on 360 video uh, on the civil rights movement and particularly these, uh, the lunch counter sit-ins that began in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, and this, this uh, experience that we created mostly for the university community had a real impact. Uh, and so after that, JJ and I were talking, uh, and we said, well, let's, let's take on a bigger project. 
you know how these things are. Sometimes you don't know how much you're going to bite off. Uh, and this was a, a big piece. But we quickly settled on the Constitutional Convention uh, because it's so thoroughly documented by Madison and other delegates. Uh, and uh, we challenged ourselves uh, to create a virtual reality uh, experience on the Constitutional Convention. Our, our first stop was with a class I was teaching uh, in early American history, which we challenged to help us create a tabletop version of the great experiment, uh, a role-playing model, uh, which, which we did. Uh, and we found it very uh, rewarding. About this time, uh, an old friend and colleague, Kevin Hardwick and I, struck up a conversation uh, about the great experiment. Uh, Kevin is a constitutional historian, well-read in 18th century political philosophy. So we drew him in uh, to this partnership. So uh, sometimes we call ourselves the four. We don't have a real name for any entity here, uh, but we work very well together. Uh, and so we took this challenge of creating an VR experience of the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Uh, we asked our students of all of the different subjects, topics we could focus on, uh, what would be the best approach? And bear in mind that we sometimes remind ourselves that we are really sort of in the Mercury phase of this project. You remember the Mercury project from the 1950s? Uh, we feel like that's where we are with trying to embody history in virtual reality. Uh, my students, they quickly came up with, well, we got to talk about slavery, enslavement. And uh, also the other subject was the Electoral College, the question of how to elect a president. And we chose the latter uh, because it had current political uh, importance, but it also had a, a concrete outcome of the debate. Slavery was all over the Constitutional Convention, uh, and the discussion of it erupted in many different forms. It would be much harder to capture in a virtual reality uh, experience. So uh, we went with the question of how to elect uh, a chief executive of a republic the size of the United States at the time. And frankly, and all those delegates in Philadelphia knew this, no one had ever done this before. They debated in legislatures, they'd elected governors, but a president of a republic the size of the United States was an unknown territory. And they admitted, uh, many of them, that this was the most difficult question they had to face. But we could take the notes on the, con uh, con of the, of the convention, distill them down uh, into a tiered series of experiences, beginning with a witnessing of the debate, uh, and then an opportunity for a participant, there could be up to nine of them, to sit down with one of the delegates in an educational experience in which that delegate, or rather the avatar of that delegate, sitting in Independence Hall, would chat for about 15 minutes about, well, their life experience, their past, uh, but their positions and their principles. And then from that point, uh, we devised a system whereby participants would move progressively into the debate itself, embodied in avatars of those delegates. The first stage was reading through the script as they'd witnessed it, as participants had witnessed it just a few minutes before. Uh, the second stage is putting that script into their own words. And a final stage uh, in which the debate was open on related issues. One of the issues that we ran by students uh, was that of, well, if you were in Congress today, debating the issue of an amendment to the Constitution to abolish the Electoral College and replace it with a popular vote. How would you argue that? What's your position? Attempting to bring people into uh, this rhetorical context of debate at the convention. And just finally, let me mention something about our objectives uh, in doing this. The first two are to explore the value of 
virtual reality uh, to history and the other way around as a means of doing scholarship and also education. Part of the great experiment is to see whether or not virtual reality, immersive technology, is a viable means for doing scholarship. And those of you, and I know a number of you here, are involved in digital history. And we all know the challenges in academia of those who commit uh, to digital history uh, in terms of the normal career paths and recognition. So the question of, well, virtual reality and scholarship, how does that develop? That's one of our questions. And then applying uh, the great experiment in educational environments, higher education uh, and the schools. So those are two of our, of our objectives. Another one, a uh, third objective, has to do with the nature of 18th century debate, legislative debate. We've recreated that debate, and if we're successful, we're putting people into the debate itself. And uh, with a philosophy that debate at the Constitutional Convention, well documented, was an honest engagement of individuals from different contexts, different parts of the country, different philosophies, in an active engagement with each other, reasoning through problems, through viable solutions. And we're very cognizant of how, in many ways, different the nature of debate and rhetoric in the 18th century is from our current politics, in which that kind of rational engagement coming from different points of view, devoted uh, to the solution of issues and problems or the creation of constitutional institutions is, well, it's, it can be for people today like a deep dive uh, into the past. Uh, and so we have this pedagogical uh, purpose, which uh, Professor Hardwick will talk a bit more expansively of that engagement uh, with a rhetorical process that was designed to bring people together, to reason together, and to devise rational solutions uh, to issues. And the final purpose uh, has to do with the phenomenon uh, that is very familiar to individuals uh, in the field of immersive technology, often called presence. Uh, some of you who experienced the great experiment this morning might have found yourself, I hope, so engaged in being in Independence Hall that may, perhaps you lost track of the fact that you were sitting in a room across the street and there was a world going on around you. Maybe you were there in that moment, present in that moment. Let me give you an example of my first ex that, of that feeling of presence that is a powerful phenomenon of virtual reality. Uh, the Skill Lab uh, folks created a, a maze at the Skill Lab, which takes, uh, occupies the, uh, the foundation uh, room, the basement of a large building. It's about 200 feet long by 50 feet wide. And they created a virtual maze through it and recreated a kind of catacomb environment. And you could start at one door, as I did, I put the hood on, and I was in this catacomb-like environment, and I started walking. Well, I was at first very worried that I would knock into chairs or uh, there were columns uh, throughout this environment. But very shortly, I find myself, I was there in that maze and walking through tr trusting that the designers did not have, have me walking into a column. Uh, but I could make choices, and I could move through it. I was present there in that moment. And after making a series of false moves, I finally got to the other side of the room uh, and the uh, opposite door. That's presence. And one of the objectives of the great experiment is to create that ex feeling of presence uh, in the Constitutional Convention. And I think we can all imagine ourselves there 
feeling the importance of the moment, the weight of the future of this emerging nation on our, soul, our shoulders. And the delegates well, often commented that their decisions would affect in their terms millions yet unborn. So what would our response be? Would we rise to the occasion? Feeling presence, being there, would we rise to the occasion of addressing each other in a way that produced a viable constitution? Because we knew if we failed, that this new country would likely fail. So that feeling of presence was on one of our objectives, to give people that feeling of needing to rise to an occasion that was created at that moment. And I'm not talking idly here, uh, <laughs> in a, a really kind of eerie way, George Mason uh, foretold of, of this experience. Uh, before the convention write, uh, began, he was writing to his son uh, fairly regularly from uh, Philadelphia. And uh, just uh, as, a, as a parting thought, I, I want to read uh, what he said, because in some sense, what he said about the convention and its eminence and its importance resonates with any of us trying to recreate that feeling of presence for people today. Through the calm, sedate medium of reason, the influence which the establishment now proposed may have on the happiness or misery of millions yet unborn is an object of such magnitude as absorbs and in a manner suspends the operations of human understanding. And that's a description of presence. So I'm going to yield to my friend and colleague, Mohammed Obeid, uh, and he will walk us through uh, some of the details of how we're creating the great experiment. Mohammed. So I think I'm supposed to stand right here. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. This, is, uh, this, is all, this has been uh, a blast since the morning. I, um, I want to make sure that uh, b before I start, I recognize and, and uh, in fact turn your attention to the fact that a lot of the work that you saw in the video that you saw this morning in the experience um, and the work yet to come is actually mostly done by students um, uh, from different fields, uh, uh, in fact, in some cases from more than one uh, institution. So I'm very proud to, to, to say that you know, we have not only a pioneering program, but also a, a, a really a, a project here that is so cross-disciplinary uh, that it, it, it involves faculty, staff, and students but all the, that come from so many different fields. Um, one example is the fact that most of the Independence Hall room itself, the design of it, was done by an English major um, and, and a, uh, uh, a, you know, a uh, Double major in what are you majoring in? <laughs> English and media communication. Media communication and English double major uh, supervised this, the script of the motion capture production that eventually made its way to become the the movements of the avatars you'll see uh, in in the experience. So having said that, I I, I do want to say that uh, I, I tried to count, but I think we're north of a hundred students that were involved in this project so far. Uh, from script development to uh, concept uh, over to uh, 3D modeling, design, programming, uh, and you can kind of see the breadth and in, in the, in the, the type of range uh, that, that, and the, really the components of a project that, like this uh, to take place. So with me today here, obviously I can't bring all hundred of them. Uh, in fact, some of them already graduated, uh, but I do, we do have, I uh, just want to recognize uh, Kesey Graf here with us who uh, worked on the project, now a junior, I think, right? Uh, a former graduate, just a, a fresh graduate of the VR design program, Orion Tai is here with us. He's worked on this project for quite some time and continues to do so. And then our uh, uh, lab or our, our skills uh, operations manager, Duwajani Benjamin, is the person who makes sure the logistics uh, are, are, are in, in the right, in the, are put together in the right way and make sure we don't, we don't run into walls. So thank you everybody for, for coming here and for all the work you've done. I also, um, 
I also want to recognize, uh, you know, our other two colleagues. That, uh, is it the four musketeers, or what is it? <laughs> so, it could be uh, the four practically anything. Yeah. J JJ and Kevin uh, to, to, to be here in person, but hopefully, uh, you know, you can uh, get the, the sense of really cross-disciplinary partnership that we have here. Two historians, a, uh, a former theater expert turned immersive experience uh, expert, and an engineer uh, to come together to put something like that together. And that includes also um, students of all of the above. So um, uh, we kind of, uh, we, we're, we're really fortunate to have these overlapping areas together to, to make like something like this happen. The project now is, uh, if you could maybe share my slides, the project is not quite in an embryonic phase, so we've grown out of that. I would say it's a five-year-old now. So hopefully it's, uh, it's growing um, uh, as, as we speak. I might have left my clicker here, but um, I want to walk you through some of the things that, that answers or attempts to answer the how, as you may wonder. Some of you have tried this this morning. If you haven't, we actually have a setup with us here in the room, and after this talk, you'll get a chance if you want to uh, enter the virtual Independence Hall um, and uh, meet some of the delegates and, and uh, maybe even witness some of the debate. So what, what this took uh, to come together is actually a lot of collaboration with, with this, what we call the subject matter experts, uh, or SMEs for short, uh, Independence Hall and National Constitution Center, uh, in, in addition to all the historians that we consulted with and the ones we have on board. So um, can you uh, forward get one, one or two clicks? So the first, the first thing is to build the room itself. Uh, go ahead, click a few times if you don't mind. So we, we uh, the three steps, so to speak, is to build the, the room and then build the, the avatars of the, the individuals and then bring those avatars or, or founders to life, uh, so to speak. Uh, and, and then if you, go, if you can go next, I'm not sure if I'm controlling it or you, but we used Habs drawings and architectural, uh, architectural drawings and, and photos uh, to, uh, to capture the scale and the, the, really the dimensions down to the inch of Independence Hall worked with our colleagues at, at uh, MPS to uh, you know, come, make, make sure that we have a good understanding of uh, everything from, from uh, you know, props that's in the installation or original objects that existed at, that, at the time down to the color code of the, ta the green tablecloth in the room. Go ahead. So uh, putting all this together uh, allowed us to, in addition to site visits, of course, uh, thanks again to, to MPS for, for doing this, go ahead. Uh, allowed us to do something, put something together that allow that basically gives us the the freedom uh, in in three dimensional worlds and spatial computing to really once you create the room you can light it up in whichever you want you can make it day or night and if this is a video if you click on on the side of the video here and you might have seen some of that in the in the promo earlier so putting it together as a as a three dimensional room first we then add some textures and materials to to bring more color to it we then add some volumetric and lighting and, and effects and uh, that allows us to now have basically a place you can you can walk around in and you don't have to be in philly to do so go ahead um so that's what to your left is the real uh the real deal and our attempt to come close to it not quite there yet but our, our attempt to uh, to do so uh so go ahead so now now that's with with independence hall in place now what we did is we uh, went to signers hall across the street 3d scanned uh everybody in signers hall uh, and use these uh, 3D, dimensional 3D scans that you see here on the bottom left, um, combination with uh, uh, the most authentic portraiture we can find, again, with the help of our, our colleagues uh, at MPS, and together, uh, hours uh, behind it, uh, use uh, spatial computing and computer graphics and 3D modeling uh, tools and software, uh, be able to recreate the avatars uh, as you see here. One more, uh, Franklin covered by a little label there. Um, there he is. Thank you. So that's the actual um, uh, statue, uh, and then our recreated uh, avatar of of, uh, of the delegate. Uh, what you might have seen this morning may may still need some work, and we recognize that. This is why I say it's a five year old now, so it's not quite ten year ten years old. Um, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, and then it's bringing delegates to life. So, and this, this, uh, this was a very exciting step because we took these scripts and then we hired voice actors to bring, first of all, from an audio perspective, bring these scripts to life, recorded the audio 
um, as well as we can, we, as, we, as well as we could, uh, you know, including the accents and 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 uh, really allow or 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 have the voice actor director uh, to. Um, have the, the freedom to bring these or allow the actors to kind of step into and embody uh, these these founders. And uh, we recorded these audio uh, pieces from the script and then brought in, well, actually, uh, to, to bring in actors to come and act out the movements of and the gestures and the facial expressions of the avatars, we first had to build a system that allows us to do so. So we actually built our own motion capture studio, uh, our students did. Again, I, I like to point to put this back to our students. So they spent some time uh, over a summer to build uh, performance capture and motion capture studio uh, that uh, includes a helmet that the actor would put on, as well as gloves to track the fingers, um, sensors that go on every joint of the body. Together, all together, three technologies talking to each other that allow us then to bring in a rehearsed actor on the script, and we give him a teleprompter. We, uh, and this was an entire summer of just the production of, uh, of all this. Some of you met uh, Roger Sherman today. That was actually an actress. So that it's a woman who did that. Go ahead. I think there's one, one more slide maybe here. Could you click on this? This is a video. So here, this is our, one, of the, one of our first early drafts uh, or attempts at the, uh, the motion capture system that, that, uh, that we, uh, we uh, modestly built uh, in, in, uh, in the lab. And the tracking comes from, just to kind of give you the, this is the scaffolding behind the view, behind the scenes view. These gloves and the finger and the, and the sensors all over the body is what allow us, we didn't have to put on an entire suit. We just rely on tracking the joints. And uh, we have some, we have some uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools and, and software that connects the joints and make it into an entire skeleton that controls, in this case, the, the scaffolding avatar. But the data we track to move this avatar to the left, we can now make Franklin, Wilson, whoever, move this way. It's, it's data we just drag and drop on any of the avatars we created and then get that motion. I think that's the last slide, unless there's one more. That's it. Yeah, so if you could, uh, that's, that's it, thank you. So the, uh, the, the, the kind of the, that's the story of putting it together or the how, if you will. But again, it's an ongoing process. The, um, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Hofstra, talked about the levels or the five tiers of this environment. So right now we're uh, getting ready to finish up the first or fir first tier and the second uh, at the same time. Uh, but really it's a five tier experience. And our hope is to allow users, whether students or, or you know, visitors of museum exhibits, ho however this takes shape in the future, to step into or become present um, in, in an environment of 1787 and, uh, and, and learn a little uh, from, from uh, the civil discourse that took place uh, at the time. Not to mention that the script that they're uh, learning and uh, at some point in level three embodying, so Wilson will actually, after you sit down with Wilson, he's going to say, I'm tired, I'm not going to go to the debate tomorrow, you're going to take my place. So you actually come back to the debate again and you'll have to... Um, just like you did in level one, now in the debate, when it's Wilson's time to speak, everybody's going to look at you. And the, the ex experience will literally stop until you get up and say what Wilson would have said. Because you've just sat with him last night. We gave, we gave you a night scene uh, setting, 15 minutes with Wilson to learn about him. Now you're, you should be experienced enough to, to take his place. Uh, use his own words. Level four, make his points, but use your own words, not his. Level five, become Wilson, but talk about something else, not, maybe not the Electoral College, and beyond, perhaps even use that fifth, fifth level as a platform for debate um, that includes these individuals, maybe uh, others, what would Wilson say if he were in Congress today? Um, questions like this is what that platform would allow, would, would allow us to, uh, to, to answer. So um, this uh, increasingly participatory, um, increasingly present uh, experience is, uh, is what, we, what we're attempting to, uh, to, to kind of experiment with, hence the name. Um, and um, this, uh, the, the changes from one level to another is there, there are changes in presence, there are changes in participation, interaction, and many more. In fact, it, it turns out that it's, uh, after we dug into it, it's, it's, so, it's so many and multifaceted that um, my colleague JJ Rosella here and I published a taxonomy on what that is. So I encourage you to find that and, and read it if you want to know about the, the, maybe the science of, the, of this uh, the increasing action immersive technologies. 
Uh, but otherwise, anything you saw today here or you know, when you tried the experience, uh, if any questions come to mind about how it's being done or if you, you think there's ways in which we can work together uh, to, uh, to better this and make sure that it's, it is, uh, you know, it's moving in the right direction, we're all, always happy to receive feedback and, and collaborate even more. We've, this is actually why we come here. And this project has taken us to many venues like this one, and we, we, we our hope to be able to, uh, you know, go to these places and meet people that that uh, that can help us make this a better a better environment. Because after all, it is an experiment, right? So with that, I'm going to turn turn it over with uh, with the time I hope we have uh, to uh, my colleague Kevin, who's going to talk to us a little um, about the uh, intellectual uh, aspects of of this uh, of this experiment. Kevin. Make sure you unmute yourself. Thank you. Here we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone, am I, am I live? Yes. Oh, cool beans. Thank you all. Um, I want to reiterate what uh, Warren Hofstra said um, about gratitude. I'm immensely grateful uh, to be participating in this event, and I'm really regret regretting that I'm not there uh, physically. I have COVID, <laughs> or I'm recovering from COVID, um, and uh, and COVID fatigue is a real thing. Uh, and um, and so while I've been out uh, ill, um, I've tried my best to do the things that uh, academic historians do, uh, amongst which is to consume history. Uh, I read a, a a really good monograph by a guy named Paul Polgar, which I imagine many of you all have read or are familiar with. Uh, I watched uh, a documentary uh, about John Adams. Uh, I listened to uh, a show um, uh, about Alexander Hamilton. Um, and uh, and what I what I'm reason I'm mentioning this is is because we have these words right uh, that we use to describe those different ways of consuming history. We read, uh, we watch, we listen. Um, and those are different media, right? Uh, they are uh, different ways, each of which brings with them uh, strengths and weaknesses. What makes VR different, we don't have a good word. I, to say that I experienced an experience seems a little bit redundant to me. There's just something wrong with that. Um, but that's the word we use. We, we don't read uh, or, or watch, you experience it. Um, and it's a VR experience is the thing that you're that you're consuming. Um, it brings with it a, a you know each of these different uh, uh, media uh, bring with them different psychological engagements. Um, with VR, what is really distinctive about it is that it transports you. It gives you the well, it's not just an illusion because it's actually happening in your in your mind. Um, the, the, as I understand the psychological studies, um, there is this sort of moment of transition where your brain interprets you as being physically present in the experience. That's what we, we talk about when we use the word presence uh, to describe that, that transition uh, that takes place. And that's immensely powerful when it's done well. If we did a, 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 even come close to that in uh, the great experiment, uh, we've done something that's a, a dramatically different way, it seems to me, uh, of participating or consuming history. And I really want to spotlight what seems to me to be both the strength and the weakness of the, of the media. When I read Paul Polgar's book, I am able in my mind to reconstruct how Polgar, the, the epistemology, if you would, behind uh, Polgar's reconstruction of the past. Uh, and that's done rather overtly through annotations, which of course we all learn to pay attention to. Um, and um, a documentary uh, has other mechanisms for showing you the constructedness, right, of, uh, of the thing that you are consuming. Um, but in VR, the whole point of it is to be transported into this environment. And what is, uh, I think, missing uh, or at least what is uh, um, maybe harder to see is the constructedness of it, the epistemological foundations that undergird everything that, um, that you experience because everything in it uh, is purposeful, is, is the result of uh, decisions made by the creators uh, of 
um, of the thing that you're you're consuming of the experience. Um, and so I don't quite know. Uh, you know, I think one of the things we have to figure out is how do you document um, the epistemological foundations underneath it, particularly given this is a work of scholarship as well as something that is perhaps consumed for you know educational or entertainment purposes. Um, and I think that's a, a, a an issue that I don't have an answer to it, but but I, I see it as a, a clearly as a problem that I think we have to confront. So th that's the the sort of I don't know historical methodological point that I wanted to to draw to and, and get reactions to um, you know your thoughts uh, on that particular uh, issue. Um, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to run out of time. Uh, lots more to say, but but I, I think that's uh, enough. Uh, and I'll pass um, the baton uh, to um, JJ Rosella. Hi, it's such an honor to be here with you today. Um, my excitement, and I'll keep this very brief, is if you can step into a world where you're hanging out with Tom Sawyer and watching him convince his friends to paint the fence, is it a different level of experience than reading something that has to be built abstractly in your head? If you can be in Versailles with Louis XIV and Le Grand Condé and see their conversations and understand their culture, um, is it, is it, can you get a significant level of learning? Um, I, I left, I moved out of academia because it couldn't, it wasn't moving fast enough for us to build but the academy is essential. Um, we need to validate. We've been able to validate through juried um, um, panels and, and, and groups to, to validate writing, right? But we need to validate this new, um, this new medium. And it's going to require academia to get involved in, in other historical and, and um, you know, reliable sources um, on a way that I don't think has ever really been done with even video, right? It's almost like we let the world define where the quality of, of history comes from in video without any, you know, so how do we begin to validate these new experiences? Um, otherwise, anybody out there is going to build them and, and who, how do we know what is truth? So um, I say that only because there's a great need for you to get involved in this um, as this new um, experience evolution happens to our entertainment and to our learning. Um, and, and also just to mention that the company I have outside is now utilizing what Dr. Obeid and I built um, for the Department of Homeland Security. So it's being utilized by the government. Um, it's coming our way. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a frontier. So nobody's an expert. We're all out there figuring it out. Um, and so this is just an invitation to come to the table if you wanted to play with us. Yeah. Yeah, we've got about... Sure, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, so. Uh... All right, here you go. Hello, I'm the director of academic programs at the Jack Miller Center, Tom Cleveland. And I, Thank you, right, well, happy to help. And one, one thing I really appreciate about all your presentations was your awareness that it wasn't a straight up pitch. This is awesome. Everyone should buy into it. You were, ex you have questions We're about, exactly. And I really appreciate that. So I've got a lot of questions, but one I was wondering about, you were talking about the possible pedagogical uses. You have to see what the pedagogical uses are. And I'll just express my own, my own prejudice is the best way to learn is by reading books and then talking about them with people. Um, that, or that's most of what my education has been. And I, like I said, have a very strong prejudice in that direction. Um, now, you talked, to, you talked about the advantages of like role playing itself, just forgetting about VR, something that can be added here. And I guess I, if you could just, I liked your awareness that you don't know how it's gonna work, but like, what are your guesses about the good things about the VR experience that can't be captured or supplement other 
that's the more basic experience I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, let me defer uh, to, to JJ Rosella. Uh, JJ, did you hear the question? And uh, I, this is a man who has broad experience that he brought to Shenandoah uh, in theater, uh, in movie direction and production, uh, in role playing and in simulation. So, JJ, do you want to respond? Yeah, so um, there's the, the benefits are massive, right? And they start at scale. If you think of what, when if you could take an experience, if experiential learning is what most of us, if we think of when we met our career, it looked vastly different very often from academia, from when we were in school. And then as we were learning inside of the career, we learned from doing, we learned from experience. But that experience lives in your brain. There was no way to capture it, right? Unless somebody's there with a video. Well, what if you could create those learning moments and create those visceral experiences? And to what Warren was saying in presence, you can have that, that visceral experience actually is firing thousands of synapses versus when you're getting a lecture, the singular synapses that are firing. So you're memorizing so much more viscerally than just intellectually. Now think of the fact that you can do that to a million students at the same time, right? And think of the fact that the, your, that student isn't in a class, they're in a personal moment, right? So they're not some, they're not in some wash of 300 seat lectures listening to somebody talking to, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a person who's not actually in the room, but now it feels personalized. So personalized learning versus cohort driven learning is one of the things that's going to come out of immersive training. And it's going to be part of this new experience economy as we see experiences being built and distributed at scale like goods and services. There's actually so much to talk about. And if any of you are interested, we would love to share with you because our whole goal is to try to see the industry so that you know we can all get somewhere together. Uh, let me point out that we have an abandoned text, believe me. Kevin Hardwick and I are actively involved in preparing a book manuscript on the question of the intellectual origins of the Electoral College. There's been uh, a sophisticated scholarship on the application of the institution and its changes over time. But we're looking at the intellectual origins, where it came from. It's a fascinating subject, but if all works well, there will be a book to accompany uh, the great experiment. And we have another document called the Expicatus, in which we trace all of the decisions we made uh, in its production. I don't know if anyone else wants to respond at this point. Uh, Here you go. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to thank thank you all for th for the presentation. I, I think this is the experiment's a great great opportunity. It's a great title for this because I, I think as as JJ is saying that we're still experimenting in this. We don't we don't know what it's like. It kind of reminds me of the early history of filmmaking hmm. when people were wondering out how to put two pieces of film together. And, and, and essentially, it took a while for that to happen. And I think that's what's happening here, to try to understand what we could do with a medium like this in a historical context. I think your choice of, of selecting a very heavily documented event is, is really is really the way to go with this so that there's no special um no speculation you don't have a disnification of history you have actually something that's documented and can show that this is what happened i'm re really interested in knowing how you're going to involve people in in mm -hmm. taking part in this because i think that's where the real challenge is i think you have a really nice idea in terms of how do you bring people into this how do you teach people empathy Essentially, if you're saying, if you're saying, this is how that person thinks, if that's how that person thinks, what, what would they do in the next step? I, I think that would really teach empathy and, and really is really nice. I, the, the issue about virtual reality versus text, I don't think is an either or issue. I think what it does is it allows academia, which is so based on text, to broaden its its audience to bring people who don't respond to text to the same types of understanding that our notion of intelligence has been fairly limited 
And this just gives us another medium to experiment. So I really appreciate this. And um, I'm at Drexel University, and we're working on a similar thing and trying to uh, build Peel's Museum as a learning environment for STEM and STEAM subjects, as well as historical, historical questions that it raises about education as a benefit of the Constitution. So you set up the Constitution, and this is what the Constitution is all about. How do you implement that? And we're working on how it was implemented through the Peel Museum. Yeah. So I'm interested in, in further collaborations. Thanks so much for those comments. Uh, Mohammed, uh, Kevin, uh, yeah, JJ, so, response? So, so uh, there's so much to, to respond to, of course, and uh, appreciate the words, of course. Um, you mentioned uh, further involvement. Um, I guess there's two, way of, two ways of, of looking at this. Uh, one, way, one way is how do we distribute something like this, and that's something we're actively looking at. How do we make this accessible or uh, accessible as much as possible in the future for learners and, and uh, places in which it makes sense for it to exist? Uh, the other type of, type of involvement is the continued involvement of those that make it. In fact, uh, I think the, the, the product itself uh, if we call the great experiment a product, uh, is, is something that one can learn from. It's a learning uh, tool, but in fact, it's making, the process of making it over the past four years has been a learning experience as well for everybody involved, uh, faculty included. Um, but I did see a, a small message on chat that, uh, a question, I think, uh, something that about maybe uh, uh, getting uh, maybe uh, uh, having a student chime in uh, as, as, as it relates to what that involvement uh, looked like. So I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I will hand the mic, if you don't mind, I'm going to let maybe one of our, or two or both students here, tell us about how this was, uh, in which way you were involved and what did this mean? Uh, I don't know if you can phrase the question. That I can, I can read you, you can the question it. really quick. Yeah, um, the online question comes up and they asked, I'd love to hear about how, from one of the students about how their experience working on this has changed their understanding or appreciation of history. Yeah, so, so which, which one wants to take this one? Tell, tell us how you were involved and, and how did this... Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, my name's Orion Tai. I recently graduated from Shenandoah University with a major in virtual reality design and a minor in information technology. Um, on this project, I worked on the animations. Uh, we mentioned earlier that we had real actors coming into our motion capture studio. Um, they were equipped with sensors on their body as well as a camera in front of their face. Uh, during my time at Shenandoah University, I um, took that camera footage from their face, turned it into animations, and then uh, helped apply those animations to the actual models. So when you were doing the great experiment and you saw them talking and standing up and debating the way that they were moving their face, opening their eyes, looking around, moving their mouth. I did all of that part. <clears throat> um, and then right now I'm working on the body animations by taking the movements from the sensors and cleaning all of those up because the hardware and software we had was still in a bit of a beta phase. So there's a lot of oddities that need to be cleaned up. <clears throat> so I guess over my time working on this, I kind of, came to understand a lot of the viewpoints of some of the delegates. Um, I didn't en actually engage with the scripts or the topics themselves a lot since I was mainly working with a, a animation software, but I did get to see the way that they chatted with each other, the way that they, um, I, I went over the scripts a lot. There were many parts where I was matching up lines to the actual animations of their faces and I got to see how they were going back and forth and back and forth and how there was not, as much arguing as there is nowadays, as there is actual debate, actually putting their points out there and discussing what's important, what they think needs to be said, uh, what they think will convince other people of their topics. And it brings me back to a uh, middle school when I also had to engage in some debates and how it wasn't arguments. It's actually fighting for your points by being civil and discussing the important things. So I think that's kind of the, the gist of what I learned from this project. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Casey Graff. I am a junior at Shenandoah University. I have not fully been working on this um, for a while. It was, I think, two summers ago now, but I still like to help um, out, and I still go to these type of panels where I show new people how our um, great experiment works. I was a script supervisor, and I helped out um, watching the script and making sure that the mocap and the script um, coincided and if the mocap had any animation errors i would write that down for them to know at that specific point that there was an animation error um personally for me i know that there was some moments in the debates that some of my friends were uncomfortable with because the topics were not always light. They were not how we are now. And I think it made me realize, wow, it wasn't always like this. We didn't always have a constitution. And I've always really liked, I've really enjoyed history, but to actually see it here and be able to experience it was very eye-opening. And I, I, I enjoy it. I have always, um, wanted to see it more and i'm always going to follow it even after i graduate properly good uh, thank you both and, yeah. and uh, certainly the uh, <clears throat> production of charles pinckney was uh, specifically uh, interesting um when it, and eye-opening and in some cases discomforting to, to some of the, the those that worked on it um yeah, to some we... degree all of the southern delegates who own slaves talk about the institution mm -hmm. Shall we uh, get some one more? time for one more question? Should we hear? Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm Rachel D'Agostino. I'm a curator at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And I have a quick comment and a hopefully quick question. Comment being, I'm just really, really excited by this project and um, particularly about the uh, seeing it from an accessibility lens for people with disabilities being able to access this content in a different way. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, my question is, I was really interested in those five tiers and I'm, I'm just wondering if there is a sixth or seventh or eighth tier that you envision in which multiple people can experience and interact with each other simultaneously yeah, can I take that? within yeah. the great experiment. Yeah, thank so you. thank you for bringing this up. It's actually not a sixth or seventh tier. This is tier three, four, five. Uh, so after you, tier one, you witness the debate like a fly on the wall. You don't have anything to do but spectate. Tier two, you sit down with one of the delegates of your choosing. Let's say you, cho you chose Wilson. You spend 16, 15 to 16 minutes with him. Uh, tier three, you step into Wilson's shoes in the debate, but it could be just you, but it could also be, and it's, it's connected in multiplayer. So I could be, you could be Wilson, I could be Madison, you could be Mason. Um, and when it's time for you to, for Wilson to speak, you, you get up and, and make his points. It's Mason, then you get up. So it is, it is multiplayer starting level at tier three, four, and five. I thought you were going to ask if there's a, a tier eight where we solve the issue of the college, <laughs> but that's maybe something to think about. <laughs> um, what, was there, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. It is multiplayer starting at uh, of tier three. Yeah. That's great. So, oh, sorry, no, please. I was just also going to say, but when you think of the um, what Mohammed and and all of those students have built in Independence Hall and have captured forty plus um, founders, right? Well, now we have a location. We have all the founders. What other things could we do with those individuals? Just with the assets we've already built, could we do the you know the what it, the 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 one that came before what was it the conf the articles of confederacy or whatever or uh what was you, you know um so anyway it just seems to me we have a bunch of material that we could iterate on even before we go building completely other things kevin oh he looks like he's gonna say something great um I'm muting. I'm muting. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to to go back to the professor from uh, Drexel. I didn't pick up his name, um, but I thought that uh, um, 
one of the things that's really struck me is um, the ways in which history is interpreted by a whole bunch of different professions. When we did the, the, um, the reading of the script um, by actors, by professional actors and a professional director, a voice director, um, the level of interpretation that was going on in some cases completely changed my interpretation of what was the words on the page. And this is stuff I've read many, many times. Um, so, and, and that's just one example, dramaturges also. So the, the comportment of the body uh, as somebody is delivering a line changes the interpretation. It adds emphasis in places. And those are choices that are being made by other professions um, that are doing history. It, it's quite remarkable. And I had no idea when I began this project. I was so locked into my sort of academic zone that I just was oblivious to the ways in which there are many, many other ways of, of coming into the past. And a project like this brings these people together in ways that amplify uh, the interpretive uh, part of the, of the project. I'll shut up. Thank you. So, so um, uh, we're, we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, but this is just optional. Before we end, I, uh, before I hand it off to you, I want to say that uh, in addition to the setup we had in the morning for everyone to try the great experiment, those of you who haven't gotten a chance to do so, we do have one setup here for you to try. You can step into Independence Hall, uh, witness the debate a little, at least the portion of the debate that we now have. Uh, obviously, we can, just to let you know, the experience itself could, uh, if you want to do the whole thing, five levels, this could be about three hours altogether. This is why when it comes to future involvement, we think it might be uh, maybe an installation uh, or maybe a location where maybe field trips can come, maybe a, a, an exhibit somewhere, um, or maybe a, a you know small pieces that can be digested uh, separately also. But uh, just to give you some perspective, the debate itself is obviously an entire summer, uh, but we the we ours uh, is really compiled down to about 21 minutes that's only tier one in tier two you have about 15 or 16 minutes to spend with each delegate one only minimum but then when you become that delegate you got to do that 21 minutes again but as that delegate and then keep going until level five so it's a it's this is not like a oh nice cool and then take it off this is an actual educational tool that you, if you want to do it you should want to do it and want to spend the time in it and because of that, um, uh, we couldn't come to the sh a show like this or, a, or an event like this and have you put it on for 21 minutes. So it's only a few minutes that you can try, but we do have one setup and I, I invite all of you who haven't tried it, or if you did try it and want to do it again, uh, we can be here. I think we're allowed to be here till maybe 1.45, right? 1.45 is fine, So yeah. we have about 20 minutes uh, to, to spend here. And but before we officially end, I want to make sure that you're all aware there is a chance for you to try it here. Did you want to add? Uh, anything? No, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you, to, of course, to the APS, but thanks to all of you for being here. And let's stay in touch. Yep. There you go. <laughs> nope, that was it. I was going to say thanks, everybody. Let's hear for our presenters. We already did that. So uh, thanks. Great project. Uh, see you all soon.